Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> um, before I ask for questions, if you can't see me, just move your mat so you can. Um, yeah, great, thanks. And um, I want to say something about why we, we wear robes. It's not just because the Buddha wore robes. Um, it's to freak everybody out, no. <laughs> It's so people say, why do you wear robes? No. Um, so there's, there's two reasons. And the first one is so everyone is uniform. That you don't have to worry about what you're wearing and do you look thin in this? Does it uh, go well with your skin or hair color? You know, you don't. When I first started practicing, I refused to wear a robe because um, at Cambridge Zen Center, because I grew up Jewish and you didn't wear a talus until you had like a bar bat mitzvah, you know? And so to me, like I was, you had to deserve it and I didn't feel I deserved it. So I refused to wear it, but there was this guy there that I thought was kind of cute. So every time I went there, I'd be thinking, just how do I look? <laughs> you know, I'd suck in my stomach when I was, you know, sitting. <laughs> you know I mean, so you can't, you know, you're wearing robes, you don't do that, right? We all look sort of clunky in them, and that's just how it is. You know, we wear these gray robes, and they don't fit tightly, and um, that's just what we do. Some of them, some of us look a little more elegant, and I don't look very elegant, but you know, that's just how it goes. So that's one reason. And the other reason you'll notice some of us have like the brown bibs, and some of us have the long robes, and that's uh, a sign of the level of precepts and. Um, responsibility that you've taken in the sangha. So when you first take precepts, which we're going to have a precept ceremony in two weeks, uh, uh, when you first take precepts, you're given one of these bibs, it's called a kasa. And um, that's symbolic of you have a commitment, you've made a personal commitment to practice, a, rather a public commitment to practice. You've announced publicly, I am practicing. And this is a very important part of my life. And then um, later we have 10 precepts. And what 10 precepts means is not only am I practicing, but I'm helping the Sangha to practice. So, and you know, you have to wait a certain number of years and you have to do a lot of retreats and things like that before you can take the 10 precepts. And then a few years after you take 10 precepts, if you've continued on your commitment, then you get these long robes that um, Charlie and I have. Um, which are designed to make you trip over yourself when you do prostrations. But, um, and the purpose of the long robe is so that someone new to the Zen Center can come in and say, oh, this person has been practicing for a while. This person um, is trusted to have some kind of responsibility for helping people who are newer to practice. So it's a, it's a kind of um, little signpost of this is someone that you know, you can maybe trust with your questions. And then we have more levels of precepts and different colored casas and stuff like that. And for ceremonies, Stan and I wear these gold casas because gold brocade because we're Zen masters and you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's basically sort of uh, public acknowledgement of um, precepts are basically public acknowledgement of your commitment in various ways and of also the trust that the teachers have in your development and your ability to help others. Um, so that's basically where the robes come, come from and why we wear them. Although I sh might say we're always talking about, do we, should we continue wearing robes? You know, people in America are always going like, not so much here, but well, should newcomers be asked to put on a robe? You know, you're new, right? You come in the door and what's the first thing we do before we even show you how to bow? We slap a robe on you, <laughs> you know, right? Should we do that? I don't know. But anyway, um, that's that's uh, where the robes, what the robes are about. And now I'll ask if there are any questions. I have a question. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so um, I was thinking about opinions and 
and uh, and I've heard said here and, and other teachers and other lineages and that that yeah it's okay to have opinions you just don't hold on to them but I'm wondering if you know in the Xing Xing Ming it says the great way is not difficult just don't pick and choose it doesn't say the great way is not difficult just don't hold on to your opinions you know and and if you if you have this in uh, okay so I see clearly and then I see it and then I know what to do idea which is like the the I don't know the function and I don't know what all those are I have to think and I don't know them so um, but if it's that then I'm just going to if I'm clearly seeing the situation and I know I know the situation and I know my function and then a, and an opinion doesn't have anything to do with it I'm I'm I know what to do and then I do it. So I guess my question is, is, is that, no, you just hold on, hold on to your opinions, just something we say until we actually get to the point where do we really need opinion? So you want my opinion on opinions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see clearly now. <laughs> okay. How many fingers? One. Is that an opinion? Well, it's one finger that you're holding up. Yeah, so is that an opinion? No. Yeah, so really. that mind. Okay. So if you have an opinion about something, then that's already separated from the thing itself. It's not intimate. It's not immersed. It's your opinion. And yeah, we have ideas, sure. But fundamentally, we don't know anything. Our fundamental nature is don't know. So we hold our ideas lightly. We have to have them because otherwise we can't function but we hold them lightly. We're able to shift them when it becomes clear that they're not functioning. Okay? All right? Did you like what I said? <laughs> That's an opinion. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, grab the microphone. Thank you. Should I just hold it? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, hold it by your face. Um, I've been trying to practice this idea of direct experience, uh, viewing things correctly, objectively, without attaching opinions, ideas, and without adding abstractions. I'm just wondering if, aside from meditation, there's things you can do in daily life to practice more. Um, direct experience and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, living, I guess, mindful, mm -hmm. mindful attention and experience without attaching. So when you say that you have been practicing direct experience and not having opinions, is that like in your meditation practice? Um, yeah, and also okay. just daily life. Okay. Yeah. So then the problem with that is you've already made something. And you're checking, is this my direct experience or not, <laughs> right? So that already creates that gap. So also, there is no direct experience. If you know anything about physiology, and if you know anything about neurophysiology, which is in the popular culture, so probably all of us know a little bit about it, even if what we know is not quite right. Um, it's just in the culture. So when you see something, it's not like there's this, it just maps itself right onto your brain. There's this very complicated chemical and physical processes that go on, even for the sensory information to reach your brain and the sensory information, I mean, I'm looking at you and you have brown eyes and they're kind of round, you know, but 
a round thing with a brown center and white on the outside is not what it doesn't come directly like that it goes through all these processes and then my brain looks at all these processes and then it reassembles them and decides that you have brown eyes that are kind of round you know so that's all very very complex and even that i call them eyes that i recognize them as eyes that's a very complex process you know when you have a baby and you have to teach the baby those are eyes where are your eyes where are my eyes you know and if the baby's too little it has no idea what's going on it's just go 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 doesn't know and then finally goes ah you know so there's no such thing as direct experience unmediated experience so what we what if i say what there is then i'm pinning it down but basically it's process and also we are not separate from each other we're not separated i'm not separated from this watch and neither are you and so on and so forth but that's you know if we put that up here it's meaningless so what we do for our meditation, what we suggest for meditation practices, instead of checking whether we're aware of, you know, unmediated, et cetera, not having opinions, et cetera, we just don't pay any attention to judging that, but we have very, very simple things that we do. And they're mindless. They're incredibly stupid. Like one of them, which I always recommend to beginners because it's not connected to any kind of um, Buddhist knowledge or anything, is simply counting your breaths. You know, and in the out breath, you go one, and the next out breath, you go two, and you go all the way up to 10. And of course, you pay attention to your posture. Might, if, if, you, if you're not paying attention to your practice, you might notice that I'm always slumping down and then having to go up again, and always slumping down and having to go up again. Um, I do that so much that once when I was sitting in Japan, the guy who went around with a stick kept whacking me because he thought I was falling asleep. And he'd stand in front of me with the stick and think, oh no, <laughs> here we go again. Um, but yeah, it's very important to have a good posture, you know, your hands in this mudra and, you know, down below your, uh, your stomach, you know, the, around your, your chan chan, your power spot below your belly button. Um, and that's very and stable. Your knees are, you know, are are supported. Um, it's all very important. So you pay attention to your posture, and when you find yourself doing that, you come back, um, and you have this mindless practice like counting one to ten on your out breath. Um, another one is fast mantra. But if you haven't been doing mantras, you know, here then it doesn't make sense. But once you've been chanting with us for a while and doing fast Kwan San Bosal in your mind very, very fast, or you might do slow, like Stan likes to do slow, Hwam Sung John, coordinated with his breathing. So, you know, that might make sense. And then there's great question, there's lots of practices, but they all have in common that they're not focused on us. It's not about what am I doing right now? It's a task to perform. And you will either perform that task or you won't perform that task. And when you notice you're not paying attention to that task, then you bring your mind back. And that's the most valuable thing, is noticing that you're not paying attention and bringing your mind back, because that's, you said, what happens when we're not in meditation? That's the thing that you bring with you outside. When you're off the cushion, is this repetition of you notice that you're not paying attention, and you bring your mind back. Bring your mind back bring your mind back. So we have these mindless practices and we bring our mind back to them. We focus our attention on them. Okay? And then in the rest of your life, instead of checking, am I, you know, directly experiencing what I'm doing, just ask yourself, am I paying attention? Am I washing the dishes when I'm washing the dishes? Am I vacuuming the pool when I'm vacuuming the pool? You know? So just that, okay? So thank you for your question. It's a really good question. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, 
So I guess when I'm meditating, the idea is to, uh, you know, be aware of your breath. And when you notice that your mind is wandering, you begin again. No, you don't have to begin again. You just keep going. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I guess, so what I kind of struggle with then is uh, how sensitive to set my sort of uh, thought detector. Because, uh, you know, it's, you're, you're, you are supposed to direct your, your awareness back to the breath, though. Whatever, again, whatever, not, whatever, but, your yeah, but, whatever your practice is. Yeah, whatever your practice is. If I'm too worried about was that a thought or not, then I end up spending the whole time wondering was that a thought Yeah, don't or worry. Not. Don't worry about it. You answered well, see, your own well, question. But, but, then, but then if I don't worry about it, then I just think about all kinds you of don't, things. No, no. You don't have to worry about it. You have to notice. Okay. Just notice. That's why I said, you know... To Liz, mm -hmm. how many fingers? I still feel like there's a conundrum here, though. Um, if you make a conundrum, so, you have a conundrum. Human yeah. beings, we make things so complicated. You know, when you start doing kung on practice, mm -hmm. and everyone has a really hard time in kung on practice. I mean, people just, they cry in despair because mm -hmm. everyone, because, you know, it's just so hard. It's so difficult. And what makes it difficult is that our minds complicate everything. And in fact, things are much simpler than we think they are. So you're making this, oh, it's this conundrum, it's this conundrum. How many fingers? That's no conundrum. You know? You know. So just like that. So you don't have to make a conundrum. Just, oh, not paying attention, can't bring it back. Okay. But then what happens at the end of the 25 minutes and I realize I've been, you know, Thinking about then, then, then the at the time. end of the twenty-five minutes, and believe me, I have been there. Yeah. You say, "Boy, that was a waste of my time." <laughs> <laughs> I am real. Not that practice is a waste of your time, but I wasted my own time. I had this fantastic opportunity mm -hmm. to sit here and wake up, and all I did was think about what I want to tell this person because she told me something about you know, her health, and I know what kind of doctor she needs to see, and what medication she should take, and what she should do with her life, and whether she should do yoga or Tai Chi, and all I've been doing is thinking about that, and, you know, I could have woken up. So then you learn something, right? Okay. Yeah. Sure. It's not a problem. You know, there's no such thing as the only type of practice that could be a bad practice is when you're really not practicing. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, a long, long time, when I first started practice, which is, oh my gosh, like a very long time ago, 1976, okay, when I started practice. That was a long time ago. And, um, you know, I thought it was really great. I thought it was really hot stuff. And I was telling all my, all, all my friends and acquaintances, oh, this Zen practice is so great. So I went on a blind date. So I went on a blind date and with this guy, and you know, he was a professor and I was a professor, and I, I was telling him how great Zen practice was. And he said, oh, I, I, I went to a Quaker meeting once. I really didn't like it. He said, you know, they just sat there in silence. And I just, you know, wrote a paper in my head. You know, I was working on a a paper and I just did that, you know, for a half hour and I thought to him, you're nuts. <laughs> I didn't say that, but why did you waste that time? But in his mind, if he wasn't doing that, that was so that's the only kind of bad practices you're not even trying. But you know, when people come into the interview room, I always say, How's your practice going? And I don't mean, have you attained the fourteenth heaven? And you know, that I don't mean that. I mean, are you doing it? Are you actually doing it? That's all. You just do it. You just do it. You just do it. And it will unfold the way it unfolds. And yeah, you will have times. I mean, I have a friend who once did a 90-day a, a retreat, and he was going to do a solar retreat right afterwards. And he spent that 90-day retreat planning what food he would buy for his solar retreat. <laughs> and then, I mean, what idiocy is that, right? And, he, and, and when he tells a story, it's like, what idiocy is that? We all do that. And then you learn, oh, look what I just did. 
Look what I just did. And then after a while, it loses its hold on you. It's like, I don't have to do that anymore. Okay? So thank you for your question. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, I guess it's time for announcements then. You want to turn it off?